Just a quick trigger warning for sexual violence during war. This is San Francisco. I am Toshio, and I am a journalist who has a book coming out soon on Verso Books. It's called Miss Major Speaks. Today, I have Coda from the podcast Against Japanism here, and I'm very stoked to have you on. I have been using your podcast to form my own thoughts about uh, some of the things that I think I already knew to be true about Japanese hegemony and its connection to U.S. hegemony. Uh, would you mind introducing yourself? Hi. I'm Kota. I'm the host of Against Japanese Podcast. I also have a book contract uh, with uh, Repeater Books. It's taking forever for me to write. It's really hard to balance book writing and podcast. So uh, it is uh, loosely based on my podcast. Like the, the principles that founded this podcast is to recast Japanese history through anti capitalist, anti imperialist, anti colonial, and intersectional perspectives. There's not enough in English about the connections between the U.S. and Japanese imperialism. Um, so I was really excited to find your podcast and even more excited to have you on today to kind of contextualize a little bit. I'm going to ask you to do some generalizing about uh, like the Japanese government's perspective around comfort women who were raped and enslaved by higher ups within the Japanese uh, military and government. I wanted to sort of co a comment on your what you said earlier about the hegemony of Japanese imperialism. And, you know, I, I've been listening to your podcast, Toshio, and um, I actually have some experience in organizing against police violence as well. And your your show focuses quite a bit on uh, police propaganda in a sort of like, um, yeah, how they build hegemony, you know, basically right. present themselves as a progressive or relatable officer friendly kind of thing. And, you know, that kind of thing happens globally as well. And different imperial states adapt that kind of, st of strategy. And, you know, cool Japan is one of that. And, and I also sort of look at it through a kind of Marxist lens and uh, through the uh, theory of uh, Louis Althusser, ideological state apparatuses, and, you know, the idea that basically ideologies are not simply just ideas floating around. They're uh, enforced, reinforced, and promoted by institutions. And I think this struggle around historical memory and their effort to suppress any discussions about comfort women and other atrocities committed by Imperial Japan is really spearheaded by the Japanese state and its uh, sort of um, overseas offices, basically, and entities like, um, I mean, of course, the Japanese Embassy, Consulate General, Japan Foundation, uh, JETRO, which apparently it used to be like an intelligence gathering organization, mm. like sort of like a um, organized to collect different information, like information about technology that other countries are using. Yeah, you mentioned Cool Japan. It seems to be like um, a parallel for Israel's brand Israel. Do you think that that's a fair comparison? As far as the form is concerned, you know, it is a sort of, I mean, same as community policing, right? So called that all the local police is police departments do in us and canada um so it's like pr yeah, yeah it's it's pr yeah, by the state i mean often it's you know the the term that often used is soft power right the enforces capitalism through different cultural institutions you know gramsci antonio gramsci or Althusser, uh it's sort of their contribution to marxism now it, it's kind of became a sort of catchphrase to describe what China's doing and also the stuff like Cold Japan. Anyways, what I'm trying to say is that basically how power operates, you know, whether it's right. soft or hard, you know, power operates in different ways, right? Either through, it could be through coercion, violence, outright violence, but also more like cultural through like, 
you know, films, uh, TV right. shows. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, and stuff. I was, I don't know. I was reading that uh, Top Gun was uh, nominated for a Best Picture, and the amount of U.S. military funding that went into that movie is pretty wild. The government is funding these cultural objects at a rate that I think people probably don't widely know. Yeah, I was tweeting about this one Netflix show called uh, First Love. I know what you're talking about. Yeah, songs by Utada Hikaru. It's sponsored by Pop Star, GTI, the military, you know, self defense forces. It's involved in the production. It's so it's basically a propaganda um, film about you know the good that Japanese army is doing abroad, particularly in Iraq and. You know, it, there are some scenes in the show that are like really like literally like commercials for the recruitment commercial for the. It generally has an effect of sort of legitimizing and uh, gentrifying imperialism. And another effect is sort of, yeah, promote Japanese-ness and sort of call us into being a Japanese subject, right? Right. And right. that also happens in regards to comfort woman uh, issue. Like sometimes embassy directly intervenes. I don't know about the specific situation in San Francisco, but, you know, in some places they, you know, they actively try to stop the statue from being built or they try to like discredit right. it. Uh, here in Toronto, they, it's not about comfort women, but the Nanji massacre, like the, the provincial parliament try to pass a bill to commemorate it. And, you know, they basically sent the letter, you know, really try to stop it and kind of, promoting this idea that any any negative spotlight on Japan is uh, just causing division, kind of like, yeah, here uh, on a recent episode, we discussed gay pride, how the police and the local politicians were arguing that it was a policy of exclusion of police if pride didn't allow police to march in uniform and get overtime but yeah so it's this kind of like larger narrative it seems of like no no negative press something that resulted in the mayor of osaka like issuing a formal, you know, proclamation that severed ties between San Francisco and Osaka as sister cities, which, you know, it's just uh, a tourist campaign um, that Osaka and San Francisco, I'm sure many people in both cities had no idea that the two cities were sister cities, but uh, the comfort woman was a flashpoint here and in Osaka so that uh that official designation was was cut the mere mention of of um the past like you said it affects these um bureau bureaucratic structures in the present in such a way that they feel like they need to take these actions like severing ties of the sister cities and it also sort of like mobilize those of us in the diaspora to sort of like defend Japan, right? Like sort of like mm -hmm. you know, the ideal Japanese subject. And, you know, in Canada, the National Association of Japanese Canadians, NAJC, they're basically uh, very much influenced by reactionary politics in Japan. Um, Jane Komori has done some excellent work in her article on Asia Pacific Journal, Japan Focus. Uh, it talks about sort of how you know, it it's sort of the whole that whole intervention in the Nanjing Massacre Memorial was sort of kind of spearheaded by NRJC. And sort of that's sort of an example. They're acting at sort of ideological state apparatus of hmm. the Japanese state. So their reach is global, right? So it's not just something that happens in Japan. They really try to reach out to to the diaspora. Outside and, you know, and, as people who are, yeah, of Japanese descent. We don't live in Japan and you have Japanese American organizations and their members basically volunteering their time to help Japan cover up war crimes. It's not that different from 
things that are happening in the U.S. There's a parallel in all of the states like Florida that are famously, you know, removing black history or removing queer history from the history books. And you have the same thing going on in Japan around the comfort woman. I will read just some excerpts from one of 10 letters that was sent to the mayor of San Francisco from Osaka Mayor Hirofumi Yoshimura. The violation of the dignity of women by soldiers during wartime is a common problem in many parts of the world. Each nation in the world, including Japan, should address this unacceptable problem as a common issue for human beings. It is regrettable that even to this day, there are many news reports on women and children being sexually abused on the battlefield. They cite America, Britain, France, Germany, Soviet Union, Korea, Vietnam. Well, everyone's doing it. Why are you picking on us? Which is uh, kind of what Israel does around Palestine. Just because everyone's doing it doesn't mean, you know, we shouldn't be examining it. One person's opinion here. Later, the, the mayor states... The very relationship of trust between our cities, which was constructed over years of friendly exchanges, has ended up declining significantly. But in the future, should the city and county of San Francisco retract the Comfort Woman Memorial and plaque from public property, and when an exchange environment is properly intact again to support friendly, citizen-oriented exchanges between our cities, please inform us these conditions are met. The city of Osaka will be genuinely inclined to fully revive the sister city affiliation whenever necessary. I would like to offer my best wishes to your personal good health, happiness, and future success. Sincerely, Hirofumi Yoshimura, Mayor of Osaka. At a uh, Japanese parliament meeting, former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, now dead, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, stated that the cover woman statues oppose the views of the Japanese government and are deeply regrettable. First, I think it's important to emphasize that the problem of historical denialism is not about the past in yeah. regards to not only Imperial Japan, but Nazi Holocaust, indigenous genocide in North America, or the legacy of fascist dictators such as Ferdinando Marcos in the Philippines, champion today by his son, Marcos Jr. Um, it is very much about the present, right? It is a mm -hmm. form of bourgeois ideology promoted by the ruling classes to cover up and normalize the systems of exploitation and oppression, uh, such as capitalism, neocolonialism, and cis patriarchy that exist in this very moment. So, you know, it is only by struggling against these systems in the present and overthrowing them in the future uh, can we truly re redress these wrongdoings. And now, the popular understanding of Japanese history is that there is a clear line of demarcation between wartime and post-war periods. And, you know, the former is of uh, the wartime Japan is often characterized as the dark age of militarism, where individuals were subordinated to the nation. And the latter, the post-war period is characterized as the, the dawn of democracy. Well, in the, uh, where individuals become the subject of the nation. And accompanying this is the notion uh, enshrined in Article 9 of the post-war constitution that Japan has forever renounced war and militarism. However, while the Japanese empire ceased to exist with the end of World War II in 1945 and was you know, reorganized as a, a more ge geographically bound conventional nation state, that exists as today, I would argue that Japan today remains an imperialist country 
uh, in the Leninist sense, uh, the capital is superpower dominated by finance capital and has become very rich through the export of capital, extraction of natural resources, and the super exploitation of workers and peasants in the global peripheries. And of course, this, this doesn't mean that nothing has changed, right, since the war or this happened overnight. And by 1945, the U.S. dropped two uh, atom, atomic bombs and carpet bombed all major cities and effectively re reduced the country to ruins. The majority of its residents were very poor, living in huts, uh, surviving and hustling in black markets through the rest of the 40s. Uh, but how did Japan go from being reduced to a developing country to a capitalist imperialist superpower. It is through war profiteering. Uh, Japan profited enormously from its participation in the Korean War in Vietnam as a close ally of the United States uh, in what is known as Chosen Tokuju and Vietnam Tokuju. Uh, Tokuju means like special demand. So Japan did, did this not only by hosting U.S. military facilities, uh, bases on its soil, especially in Okinawa, which was directly occupied by the U.S. until 1972, but also by manufacturing, supplying, and repairing weapons. And everything else from shoes, parachutes, construction materials, and labor power in the form of non-combatant personnel that made these wars possible. So Japan's reemergence as a capitalist powerhouse in the late 60s onwards, uh, known as the period of, of high growth, uh, called the Seichoki, is unthinkable without these two wars, mm -hmm. Korean War mm -hmm. and Vietnam War. Yeah. And of course, its alliance with U.S. imperialism, beginning beginning with San Francisco Peace Treaty of 1952 and continuing to this day. And of course, many of these individuals in power uh, who made this comeback of Japan possible were former fascist bureaucrats, politicians, military mm -hmm. officers, academics, and doctors, such as uh, Kishinobusuke, um, uh, recently assassinated Abe Shinzo's grandfather and convicted war criminal. And yeah. medical professionals involved in the infamous Unit 731 that developed biochemical weapons and experimented on Asian POWs. Yeah. And aside from these individuals, some of the corporations uh, that worked closely with the fascist regime continued to operate after the war. And the military infrastructure used by Imperial Japan was repurposed for civilian use. Right. Not such as the Haneda Airport, it was used to be called Haneda Base um, for the mm, U.S. military. It was turned turn into the uh, just normal airport for civilians. And of course, other infrastructures were continued to be used by the U.S. for its war efforts, including the SDF itself, uh, self-defense forces. You know, they were built with the help of uh, the military officers from the U.S. Officially, it's not a military, but uh, it really of its, is kind its of capacity. It's I think the fifth biggest military in the world, and right now they're trying to make it the third biggest. Uh, by, uh, by they just came up with this uh, budget plan for the next five years. They want right. to make the GHI the third biggest military after the U.S. and China. So we they're really ramping up this militarization effort, right? Um, yeah, because I think, part of yeah. Article Nine was to you know, kind of uh, disallow Japan after World War II from acquiring some of the most uh, brutal and most capable of of killing the, the highest number of people kinds of weapons. Um, and that is happening now. Uh, they also, uh, I mean, they're being sort of doing this really slowly. And, you know, I think, I think they want to ultimately change the constitution, but also like they been putting efforts into making it ineffective by basically adding some sentences there that actually sort of contradicts the original wording. So the most well-known case is that the, the right to collective self-defense, uh, Shudan Tekiji again, uh, which is basically allowed Japan to attack its enemies whenever their allies attack. So 
I mean, obvious, one obvious, you know, like US is the obvious example, but also like India or Australia, when they're attacked, Japan can attack. I mean, they are basically implying China. Right. They're an the emerging superpower, right? So they're, yeah. they're, they're contending with along with the US. So yeah, it's a, it's a quite a dangerous development. Um, so I think it's really important to have this nuanced perspective on Article 9. The fact that the, really the, the, the far right is really trying hard to, or the LDP as a party, uh, is really pushing for the revision means that, you know, they consider it as an obstacle, right? Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, Japan has never ceased to be a militaristic nation. It uh, made a lot of money. Uh, it really, Japan could become what it is today because of its participation, uh, indirect participation in Korean War uh, and Vietnam War. The only difference is that it didn't send any troops. They did send soldiers to fight in Vietnam and actually engage in a lot of bloody massacres there. So that, I think that's something that's going to happen probably if the constitution is changed. I think what, what they want to do is really send Japanese soldiers to fight. But they sort of been dodging it. They kind of um, kind of loopholing it and just sort of calling it a sort of humanitarian mission or like the construction effort. That's what they said for Iraq. So um, they can get in there and uh, make some money off of the reconstruction by offering yeah, development. Yeah. So it's really an economic thing. War profiteering. Think, yeah. Yeah. War profiteering. Yeah. And and you know today. Uh, a lot of liberals uh, see the backlash against the comfort from woman issue and the problem of historical denialism as an sort of aberration uh, to the hitherto peaceful and democratic Japan and uh, uh, recent phenomena brought about by the quote-unquote ultra-nationalist far-right who want to change the constitution and bring Japan back to the golden age of fascism and militarism. And they're not wrong in principle to point this out, but but it does sort of overemphasize the change over continuity between uh, wartime and post-war, how Japan went from a fascist to supposedly democratic, quote-unquote, nation. Right. And, you know, we often lose sight of what made this democracy and prosperity possible. So looking at this history, it's not surprising that Japanese state to this day, staffed by uh, descendants of fascists and their collaborators in some cases, right? Like Abe and other like politicians, they, they sort of have like political dynasties, right? They're, they're politicians because their father, their dad right. are politicians as well. So, right. The fascists never um, left power necessarily because, um, you know, just like in every country that's ever been engaged in a war, which is every country, not everyone suddenly, you know, drops dead or stops being a fascist after the war ends. Yeah, because they're convenient for the Cold War and, you know, anti-communism, right? So you know, look what happened in West Germany. In Germany today, like neo-Nazis are on the rise, like they're becoming mainstream. Right. And even Italy, they just have like a new prime minister who is like openly supportive of uh, Mussolini. Right. Um, so it's really a sort of, uh, it's a continuation of this, um, you know, but it has really roots in the sort of the um, uh, deeply rooted anti-communism and sort of counterinsurgency against these nations like Vietnam, Korea. Yeah. And the, the nationalism, I guess in Japan, it, it does strike me as, I, maybe it's just because I am an outsider as I was uh, born in the U.S. and I only started going to Japan about 10 years back. But uh, I mean, the sort of uh, racism that is like very pointedly focused on Chinese people, on Korean people, on Filipino people, it's pretty intense. Here in the U.S., we have these draconian anti-immigration, anti-immigrant policies. But in Japan, it, it seems like they are one-upping us on that front. Yeah. I mean, 
I would say immigration in Japan is basically non-existent. Like it's it is very difficult to become uh, right naturalized as Japanese if you're not white, <laughs> or like you know if you're from the global south, you're more imported as a sort of cheap labor, basically. Yeah. Uh, the immigration authorities uh, detaining migrants without any charge or for uh, indefinite period as well. I mean that institution all also derives from the the pre-war period as well. It's a uh, Tokyo case that's like special high police. Um, uh, they eventually became, and the war ended, and all the Koreans who were formerly considered Japanese, right? Was um, Korea was directly occupied by Japan. It, w- it was considered part of Japan. Now suddenly they became foreigners, right? Because Japan became small. There was no longer an empire. And so they had to come up with this like a uh, new immigration system, and they make the lives of Koreans very uh, difficult. You know, now all of a sudden they're considered illegal aliens. Anyways, where was I going? I I love going on tangents. I do the same. Yeah, the more that I think about it, the more that um, Japan and and Israel seem like two peas in a pod in ways. When I was in Japan, I uh, I helped with the camping around uh, Shigeno Fusako, uh, who was a leader of the Japanese Red Army. She worked with the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, which is uh, uh, one of the resistance organizations in Palestine. Their ideology is a sort of Marxist-Leninism, also like a socialist perspective on the liberation of Palestine. And, you know, he, she uh, dedicated herself to Palestinian liberation, basically, like she, uh, she became a terrorist in the eyes of bourgeois media and all the imperial states, of course, including Japan. She's very, very demonized. Um, you know, she's one example of like this boomer uh, who lived through the 60s and 70s and really uh, served the people, really. Um, and other, you know, other veterans of that generation, I mean, not all sort of maintain the commitment to the revolutionary politics. Some of them sort of just became salary men or kind of nostalgic salary men. <laughs> but, um, you know, the point is, you know, and also like younger generation, right? I think there's a lot of talk around uh, in Japan and elsewhere, sort of the generation left. They try to sort of say that young people are, uh, you know, inherently progressive you know this whole generation is left kind of thing you know it's i don't know i don't really buy that like there are a lot of like I, a lot of my friends like the, the the people i grew up with most of them are really right wing you know like they're I think that, i mean even they you know some some of them like even consider like kind of <laughs> entertaining with lefting i left wing ideas around the 2011 like after the nuclear meltdown and but now that like, they're like, oh, like, oh, I think we need nuclear power and, you know, we need military, like we need to be stronger against China kind of thing, you know. It's, wow. So that's kind um, of been forgotten in some ways. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, even the the mem- like historical memory stuff is like, yeah, I mean, I don't think they want to talk about comfort women or anything like that. But I mean, you know, but it's, you can't really genera- like, generalize everything. It's contradict, you know, there's contradiction yeah. in everything. I am a communist, so I try I try to look at that way. So there are different there are class struggles in each generation happening. You know, there are younger activists who are sort of uh, um, campaigning for the rights of migrant workers and, you know, campaigning for climate justice and stuff like that. So, you know, um, I think, yeah, I, I don't think you can generalize. Really. One of the few stories that I think that come out of Japan that's involved protest well there's two that i think of one is the anti uh, olympics protests prior to the flop <laughs> that was the 2021 olympics in tokyo and then also the okinawa protests against base expansion by the us so those are those seem like um kind of bright spots as someone from the u.s i mean people here you know uh the world ends at at hawaii basically and so i feel like it's very easy for people in the u.s to 
um, generalize about people in other countries. So yeah, thanks for humoring me with that last question. What has been super affirming, I think, about your podcasts and your work is that it kind of like uncovering this history that I think for a lot of English speakers was unknown until very recently about how deep the like communist movement was in Japan. Yeah. But yeah, like there is a resistance happening. There has always been resistance, you know, like a lot of revolutionary movements happened there, uh, um, not just in the 60s, but also like in the, in the interwar period as well. The Communist Party was much more revolutionary back then. And, you know, they try to engage in armed struggle more than once uh, in, in both pre-war, but also like um, in the 50s, there was a, um, actually just about when, uh, when San Francisco Peace Treaty was signed, the San Francisco Peace Treaty, that's when officially the war ended, so to speak, yeah. and ended the occupation of Japan by the Allied forces. And that's where it mandated Japan to compensate countries that it occupied, even though it exempted Korea and China. Like, I mean, you know, a lot of people, for, um, Japanese people, I think, are hoping for like a multilateral. Because, you know, the Allied forces, they included the Soviet Union and the Republic of China uh, before the revolution. So, you know, it was just a whole bunch of countries there, not just the U.S., but... Right, at the Opera House here in San Francisco. Ended up bilateral, just basically Japan and U.S., so it pissed a lot of people off, including the Soviet Union, but also, like, workers and students in Japan, and there was, like, a big riot that happened on May Day of that year, 1952. It's called Bloody May Day, and basically they... The protesters basically fled a bunch of cars and torched the uh, U.S. military vehicles as well. And I think one or two protesters died. Um, really, the, there was a sort of radicalization in the JCP, and some of them basically took inspiration from the Chinese Revolution and went to the countryside and tried to start armed struggle. They failed, and party eventually like renounced it, you know, and completely became like. Uh, really formist uh parliamentary party and uh, that actually also like uh, also alienated a lot of young militants and that sort of signaled the beginning of the the new left all that history is really what i'm interested in i'm yeah. actually talking to you from uh it's called united nations plaza and oh, okay. in the middle of the city that's dedicated to the un charter human rights san francisco was really the treaty capital of the world it seems like for a minute there <laughs> it's 11 piece right and i think also to ask sort of begs the question of like what is our role in combating that kind of ideology. Yeah, absolutely. And also practicing solidarity, right? How to build genuine international solidarity uh, in the spirit of sort of proletarian internationalism, as I like to say. <laughs> I am involved in a sort of international solidarity with the, the Philippines. Uh, they have a women's organization uh, organizing specifically around this comfort woman issue called uh, Vida Filipinas. Yeah, their perspective is that basically a uh, similar denial happened. I mean, not only from the Japanese government, but the Philippine government itself. They're very, you know, because the Philippine is a semi-colony, right? So they're very much dependent on uh, importing capital and also consumer goods from, the, from abroad, uh, like, you know, imperialist countries like, U.S., Canada, and Japan, and, you know, a lot of corporations like mining companies and other sort of like agribusinesses are sort of ex extracting their resources. And also like there is huge uh, labor export policy. Uh, right. Basically, you know, labor power is a commodity under capitalism. So basically, yeah, labor power is considered their, one of the, their biggest export in the Philippines. And, you know, yeah. you see, yeah. you know, migrant Filipina, Filipino, uh migrant workers everywhere right including yeah Japan. 
and here and uh, anyways um it's like an indentured so servitude japan almost oh yeah oh yeah yeah very difficult conditions and hor- horrid conditions you know there are japanese corporations operating in the philippines uh but also japan is uh one of the, the philippines biggest donors of oda official development assistance oda is basically you know i mean it's quote-unquote aid uh sort of like kind of generosity you know kind of framed as a sort of like act of generosity from right developing develop developed countries but you know it's actually you know it's designed in a way that benefits japanese corporations and of course and so it, it's a basically export of capital basically they want to profit from it and um but they're just sort of framing it in a more very charitable way it makes it look um, like so they're giving the context, all this money and, back yeah yeah so and in, in the 90s right like basically japan set up this thing called uh asian women's fund as a sort of like kind of quasi reparation it's coinciding with the some of the apologies from the politicians that happened right there. um for a brief moment there were there was like a reparations <laughs> uh there yeah. was a moment and then after which it seems like the Japanese government wanted it to completely go away, this this issue. Yeah. In particular, this Asian Women Fund was like not really a state liberation at all. It was funded through like individual donations. So a lot of survivors rejected it because, you know, what mm-hmm. they want is the official state apology and state yeah. money, right? Coming from governments. Right. So Lila Filipina is one of the organizations that basically rejected it and they're calling for yeah, like actual sincere apology from the, the state and actual reparations, but also sort of like Philippine government is basically scared of having that public discussion and they're deliberately silencing it. In the 2018, the statue like mysteriously disappeared. And yeah, no one know why, but it was suspected that basically the government was afraid of it, that affecting that the sort of criticism upsetting the Japanese government and you know not be, being able to receive the ODA anymore. So basically kind of like it's a form of bribery and sort of like strong arming done in the financial uh, international scale. So right when they've been profiting off of all of the like you know the natural resources and the labor uh of people in the philippines and kind of this false like we're giving back in a way it's it's pretty gross yeah i mean this is what i mean by that you know it is history is the present right like it's the you know the, the the attempt to revise history is always tied to the 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 interest of the ruling class today um, yeah yeah so that's i think that's one of the examples of that you know right it's a way to sort of uh, keep philippines uh colonized by these imperialist countries mm-hmm. nothing's really changed it's just uh, just a form of oppression has changed it's no longer military and directly colonial but it's a uh, more economic and neocolonial yeah here in San Francisco, we have an organization called Soma Pilipinas. I was doing a little bit of work with them a few years back around Jennifer Laud, someone who was killed by a U.S. soldier at a base in the Philippines. So people can check that out. Um, we'll link it in the show notes. I am looking forward to your book. I'm looking forward to future episodes of your podcast, Against Japanism. People can find all over the internet. Yeah, I try to provide a platform for for education and information for English speaking audience. I do want to eventually start a bilingual program. It's been hugely eye opening for for me as somebody who I am. I was Issei Nisei Sansei, generation third generation born in the U.S and pretty disconnected until I was in my 30s. To know that the resistance did exist, still exists on some level. Um, yeah, so thank you for, for all your work and coming through. 
Thank you for listening to Sad Francisco, a podcast produced by Toshio Moronic and Caitlin Wood. We release a new episode every week with bonus episodes for subscribers of the show. And if you like the show and have a few dollars to spare, please go to patreon.com slash SAD Francisco or subscribe on Apple Podcasts and that will help us cover the editing and transcriptions for the show. See you next time in Sad Francisco.